Hi, I'm Dr. Joshua Yamamoto. I am an invasive preventive cardiologist and welcome to OMID 2022. This will be presented in October in Boston. This little presentation is going to be on stroke prevention, subtitled, There's Almost No Such Thing Really as Heart Disease, It's Just Natural Aging. Now, as I mentioned, I am a invasive preventive cardiologist. What does that mean? We are trying to be preventive. We're not just ordering tests and wondering about pills and cholesterol levels. We are trying to prevent heart failure, heart damage, premature death, and we're trying to prevent strokes. I am from the Foxhall Foundation. That is a uh, nonprofit organization based in Washington, D.C., dedicated to helping everyone age well. I also have a very active private practice. My background, I originally have uh, studied physics at Princeton and medicine at Dartmouth and trained at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. Now, Sir William Osler was the founding physician of Johns Hopkins back in 1888, and considered the father of modern internal medicine. And he had a, an expression, uh, a saying that I think is quite relevant. He liked to say that to practice medicine without study or books is like going to sea without a map. Whereas to simply look to your books and studies without seeing patients is to never go to see at all. But in the 21st century, we're entering a new era. We are at sea and we're off the edge of the map where there be dragons. In other words, we have never before had such a population of aging people that are naturally aging. And we're only now learning what's the normal biology when we go to 60 to 70 to 80 or 90 years old. And how do we manage that? And do we have to label everything a disease or is this something to be managed? So what we hope to do with, our, uh, with this talk is understand that stroke is something to be, strokes are something to be prevented. We wanna understand that there are three basic things that happen to the circulatory system to all of us as we age. It's a natural process. We have chronic vascular inflammation, which is a wear and tear process which produces atherosclerosis. We have stiffening of our arteries, which leads to uh, hypertensive changes due to changes in collagen over time. And we all lose sinus node function. And that's actually way more important than we, we once thought as we're getting older, because that's conduction disease and the precursor of atrial fibrillation. Our objective also is to develop a useful practical clinical paradigm about managing this natural aging process and an approach for every one of our patients, particularly as they're getting older on preventing strokes. And I want every physician, every healthcare provider, and even all of our patients to develop a, a default that says, what is my best stroke prevention plan, my best stroke prevention strategy? or my best stroke prevention medication. We can work back from our best, but our default no longer can be doing nothing and hoping for the best. Now, my disclosures, I am a consultant, a paid consultant and speaker for Janssen Pharmaceuticals. More importantly, I am in private practice. Most of my patients are over 65. 95% of all of my revenue comes from Medicare, that's CMS. That means in the last 20 years, I've adopted practice patterns that have been adapted and driven by the, all the requirements of Medicare, for better or for worse. And Medicare is a marvelous program, uh, but they certainly have rules as to how we practice. So I do have a built-in bias that I practice strictly in terms of how Medicare patients uh, are ready to be treated. Okay, so stroke prevention, the Foxall Foundation. The Foxall Foundation was actually uh, started by the brilliant Dr. Kristen Thomas, that some of you may get to meet. Um, and a, one of our first programs in Washington, D.C. was really in helping patients with dementia, bringing some of the protocols that had been developed at Hopkins. And in our town, we have an older population, and a lot of the dementia is driven by a vascular dementia, not just Alzheimer's. And that means there's a lot of it driven by brain injury and strokes. And there was a story that came out in the paper a few years back about the latest interventional technique to try to rescue somebody from a stroke, catheter-based thrombolytic therapy and all this exciting stuff that, that can be done. And a patient of mine, Bill Lilly, came to me after the story and he said, hey, Josh, 
this is really exciting. What's the best way to treat a stroke? And I looked at him and I said, Bill, you're, you're just asking the wrong question. The best way to treat a stroke is to prevent it. And he was really kind of stunned because it didn't occur to him. And he, he looked incredulous and said, you can prevent a stroke? I said, yes, Bill, you can. You can prevent a stroke. And we turned his question into a statement and we actually put our paradigm into print. And the foundation published this book, which I encourage all of you to find, all the proceeds support the foundation. You can prevent a stroke. And every word in that title was picked kind of deliberately. You. You, meaning when we're talking to other healthcare providers, other doctors, or whoever's taking care of patients. And you are patients. It's, a, it's an interactive process. Can. It is possible and it is also imperative. The burden is on us to prevent strokes prevent a stroke. Not every stroke. CDC estimates that 80% of strokes can be prevented, and that's even using kind of old-fashioned paradigms. We really need to be thinking about how do we prevent strokes. One of the sayings at the foundation is that good health, health doesn't just happen. You have to build it as you age. It's an interactive process. We are going to age, and we need to, we as people aging and as the providers for our patients as their doctors help people build their health as they go. The first shocker I like to give a lot of my patients is, you know, prevention isn't just about diet and exercise. Uh, we get beaten up about diet and exercise all the time. So I'm not going to tell you that diet and exercise has no role, but we, we already kind of know what we can do. And I always say, think of the rabbit. They run around a lot and they eat. Uh, what is considered a marvelous diet, but you know something, they don't live forever. But of course, we're not rabbits. We have our own genetics. The shocker is that so much of what happens in the natural aging process really has very little to do with, with diet. In particular, exercise is always beneficial. Diet matters about uh, metabolism and the tendency to be diabetic, which is really a genetic metabolic mismatching, we consume things we can't metabolize, fine. But that's still genetics. And none of us are exempt or immune from time. There are things we can control and things we can't control, but ultimately aging is an inevitable process. None of us are immune from the effects of time. And none of us are uh, exempt from our genetics, nor can we change the genetics, but we can think about how we manage our passage through time. So that really means that age itself is inevitable, but it's a well understood process. The map makers have been looking at this aging for a long time, so now the sailors out there going out to sea past where our experience lies need to really appreciate that as a well understood process, aging is now predictable it's measurable and it's manageable. And it's a process. Aging is not just a collection of diseases. It's a natural process. And if we don't manage our aging well, you're going to have the cardiovascular, the heart and circulatory changes that are going to lead to, well, heart attacks and strokes. But we don't have to. We're actually very good at preventing these things. But again, it is an active and interactive process. So, preventing a stroke. Let's be clear, what is a stroke? A lot of my patients don't even really understand that because, well, maybe our health curriculum in high school should be better, but what is a stroke? It is a cerebrovascular accident. Vascular accident. It is a circulatory issue. It's not a primary brain issue. It is a circulatory issue. That means you interrupt, you impair, you have inadequate blood flow. As a point as we think about in the future, the issue is maintaining blood flow. This is not something we talk about a lot. We talk about all sorts of number, heart rate, pressure, whatever. Those are numbers, but you need blood flow to the brain. And why do we primarily interrupt blood flow? We do it because we clot. A stroke is brain damage from a clot. It's a blood clot in the brain. And even the bleeding strokes, which are the minority, the vast majority of bleeding strokes occur uh, because of hemorrhagic conversion of a prior ischemic stroke. So you need meaning a clot. You had the ischemic stroke first. That's what you need to prevent. That is what we're trying to prevent. We die from clotting. Go ahead, look up the leading causes of death. You're going to find that they're basically related to clotting, 
heart attacks, even half of cancer deaths, the mode of death is from clotting, strokes, dementia, throw in lung disease, it's not necessarily clotting. The point is we don't see hemorrhage as a cause of death, but we do see clotting as the major driver of brain damage and disability. Okay, so where do the clots come from? From our circulation, from the arteries, the carotid arteries in our neck, from inside the heart itself, or the clots are forming in arteries primarily in the brain. The clots form somewhere, they get somewhere, it's a clot to the brain. So if we know a stroke is a clot to the brain, already our paradigm can start to evolve. Oh, well, where do they come from? And why are we forming clots? Because we're supposed to form clots. We are genetically predisposed to form clots. That's natural. Our, our cave-dwelling ancestors did not die of clotting. They died of what? Bleeding, wounds, malnutrition. So we have genetically selected out over 100,000 years to what? Clot well, heal well, and store calories well. But it gives us an approach to understand this. Okay, so then as we get older, remember, Darwin actually doesn't care too much about us after we pass childbearing age. So the things that are advantageous in our youth can start to work against us when we're older. We have chronic vascular inflammation. We have a loss of vascular compliance, which means a stiffening of the arteries. And we have a decreased reliability of our natural pacemaker, the electrical driver of our heart beats. What does that mean? Chronic vascular inflammation is wear and tear on the arteries, which leads to atherosclerotic disease. That is a process which we'll talk about. Atherosclerosis. We have loss of elastin of collagen or our arteries get stiffer. That leads to stiffer pipes. Stiffer pipes will drive hypertension. So as another process of aging is hypertensive disease. And we lose the reliability of the natural pacemaker, which leads to sinus bradycardia, which is way more important in an older population than we once thought. And that's very often the, the prodrome of the atrial fibrillation, which is so common as we get older. And so right away, we look at things, atherosclerosis, atherosclerotic process, hypertension, a hypertensive process, conduction disease, a process, not diseases, but part of how we age. So let's think of each of these separately. Number one, what happens as we get older? Chronic vascular inflammation, the wear and tear on our arteries. All right, why does this happen? Remember, I, I mentioned I was a physics major. I'm a very mechanical person. And as uh, my personal childhood hero, Jim Kirk here, is demonstrating, we have 100,000 heartbeats a day. Imagine that impact all day long. Lub dub, lub dub, this pounding pressure wave down our arteries. What's going to happen to Jim Kirk's face by the end of the day? He's going to tear off his skin. He's going to have trauma to the impact. That continuous, in, continuous pounding creates trauma. All of our arteries have endovascular trauma relentlessly all day long. It's a natural part of life. And trauma, disruption of endothelium, promotes the healing process. And so we have chronic vascular healing. That's inflammation. The inflammatory process is a healing process, and we are genetically selected to robustly heal. And so forming plaque in arteries is a part of the natural healing process. Atherosclerosis is not a disease. It is a part of natural aging. And that's great because it makes it something that's well understandable. We predict that it's coming because it always happens. It's just a question of when and how fast, and what do we do about it? But you can't beat up an artery without it changing. And we go through a process of advancing plaque burden or plaque growth in arteries. And so this is a, this is a pipe. This, this pipe here has nothing to do with the human body, but I think it's a great example of why we care about this relentless pounding an inflammatory process on our arteries. This pipe is not blocked. It could allow flow, but do you want to drink out of this pipe? The thing is, we used to be focused. In the, in the 1900s, our focus was on blockage. How blocked is something? But you know what? Blockage does not predict 
events. You don't have to be blocked to have a problem. What really matters more is the plaque burden. Blockage, like in a coronary artery, may give us angina, but the blockage does not predict the infarct, which is plaque rupture and clot forming in that artery. Plaque burden does. Having a long rusty pipe with a lot of gunk in it that likes to clot up, and if that pipe is in your neck or in your between your neck and your brain, that gunk and little clots on that rough edge is what can get into the brain. The more plaque you have, the worse. If you have a blockage, you're more likely to have a higher plaque burden, but it is not the obstruction that predicts who's going to have a heart attack or uh, brain damage, a stroke. So it's important that we start thinking in terms of plaque burden, not blockage. And that's, that's important because it's practical, because we can stop plaque progression. That is the better way of thinking about atherosclerosis as a process and stop labeling it as a disease. Okay, there are a lot of ways to evaluate for the presence of plaque. One of the most practical, pragmatic, and useful tests that you can do, especially in uh, somebody who's older, meaning 65, is a carotid ultrasound. Now, to be clear, we are not screening. It is not screening. We are quantifying disease burden if you believe that there's a possibility of atherosclerosis. You can say, well, who at 65 doesn't have atherosclerosis? Right, that's the point. How much do they have, and are we adequately stopping it? And what is our stroke prevention strategy? So an ultrasound is a quick, easy thing to do. It is absolutely painless. All you need to have is a quality technologist. This is Denise, she's marvelous. She works in my office. And we can look at your arteries. It only takes really a minute or two. But remember, we're looking for plaque burden and plaque progression. We're not looking for blockage. I mean, of course, you're gonna see blockage if you have it. So what does this look like? This is a, a carotid artery, okay? It's a pipe. It's just a pipe. So the blood is flowing through this pipe here. We, we can take moving pictures, although there's not too, too much movement typically in a pipe. This is a normal carotid artery, nice, clear pipe. Here's somebody else, and there's a little island of plaque there. My goodness, it's the bright white is the calcification of the plaque, and this black here is an ultrasound shadow. So as plaques mature, as they go through time, they actually calcify, which is a mixed blessing. A calcified plaque, whether you can see it on a CT scan, like a lot of folks get coronary CT scans, which have some utility, but calcification uh, is a later finding. Young plaque is soft and mushy and breaks easily, so progressive plaque isn't necessarily calcified. But all of that is very easy to see with ultrasound. I call this my Pac-Man plaque. This is another fellow came to my office. This plaque is growing. You can see that the plaque, sh this is all plaque, okay? It's just plaque. And this is right below somebody's brain, okay? And you can see that it can be highly irregular in shape. And that irregularity creates plenty of turbulence. And if there's any disruption of that plaque, the body will naturally begin to clot it off. And if it clots off, well, okay, the clot may not obstruct the artery here, but it certainly can embolize and go up into the brain. Sometimes the plaque is long and rough and starts to go all the way around the arteries. Again, here are the walls of the artery, the walls of the artery, and this is all plaque along the walls of the artery. And sometimes it's, it grows like a cactus into the artery. Now, this is a plaque, again, here's healthy artery, healthy artery, and this kind of fungating plaque. Now, I will tell you, all of these carotid arteries have several things in common. Each one of these are patients of mine. Every one of them is between 65 and 75 years old. Every one of them has a normal cholesterol. And every one of them has less than 50% stenosis. Okay, you following that? Less than 50% stenosis. In the 1900s, we'd get our ultrasounds because we were looking for surgical revascularization. This is not the 1900s. In the 21st century, we need to be aware, aware of plaque burden and plaque progression. 
there are scores to quantify higher or lower risk plaque, but it, it, more important is just to understand the idea that you can have plaque, and how would you know? And then it gets even more exciting. This is again, non-obstructive plaque in a fellow who was 67 at the time of this ultrasound. Uh, I, I always thought this kind of looked like a slug sitting in his carotid artery. But I'll draw your attention right to the middle here. And when you let this play, it's moving. That's a clot. That is a thrombus that is already forming on this plaque right there. So he already has thrombus in the carotid artery. You, you wonder why people have strokes? Because they have plaque. This isn't obstructive. In, again, old school, 19, uh, 1900s, the, if you ordered one of these studies, it could come back from a hospital lab and it would say zero to 49% stenosis normal. It's normal with flow. You're not going to have symptoms and you're not going to obstruct flow and you're not going to need a surgeon. But this is not healthy. This is not safe. This is not normal. Do you want to have mobile thrombus right below your brain? This fellow did great. Of course, he was. Uh, we gave him medications to arrest plaque progression and medications to prevent uh, thrombus. The body will reabsorb this thrombus. He got dual therapy with a thrombin inhibitor and an antiplatelet agent. Pills. It's not hard. Okay. So. I keep talking about the, the 1900s. My teenage son never misses a chance to make fun of me whenever I do something old fashioned to say, hey, what was it like back in the 1900s? We don't live in the 1900s now, but that's when I went to medical school. So in the 1900s, what do we do? We say, oh, we need to treat risk factors. Great. Diabetes, smoking, cholesterol, hypertension. That's fine if you not want to get into the 21st century, but the problem with that approach is that you can treat those risk factors and think you're done. But over 40% of people with good numbers, meaning we did that, we treated the risk factors, but they still have progression of plaque because treating the risk factors is not sufficient. We need to arrest plaque progression. So that's the 21st way of thinking, new school. It's insufficient to just treat risk factors. So instead of calling them risk factors, what we say is these are the things that accelerate plaque progression. What we're trying to do is arrest plaque progression and stabilize plaque. And yeah, actually in early plaque, you can cause some regression. That's not necessary per se, but you want to stabilize the plaque because growing plaque tends to be more unstable, tends to rupture thrombose, embolize, and end up with brain damage from clots to the head. So you don't feed plaque, fine. If you don't want to feed plaque, treat the diabetes, treat the smoking, treat the cholesterol, treat the pressure, great. But more importantly, we must proactively arrest plaque progressions. And in the vast majority of people, over 95% of the population, just give them a statin. You give them a statin, we don't use statins to treat cholesterol anymore. Again, that's 1900s. We use statins to stabilize plaque and arrest plaque progression. You can think of the, the Jupiter trial, looking at men and women, but a lot of women with normal cholesterol and an elevated CRP, the marker of infl vascular inflammation. And they gave them a statin, resuvastatin. And they had to stop the trial early. Why? Because the stroke rates went down. So the point is, is we arrest plaque progression. If you have plaque, you need to be on a statin. I don't care what your cholesterol is, you need to be on a statin. We've stopped treating cholesterol a long time ago. Move past that. Are we arresting plaque growth? Yes, you treat cholesterol so you don't feed plaque growth, but you can have stone cold, beautiful numbers. You still need to be on a statin if you have any atherosclerosis to arrest that. Now, for the folks who can't take statins, that's a whole discussion that uh, you can consider yourself. Uh, of the people who are resistant to statins, fine, they're out there. But uh, we have the injectables the PCSK9 inhibitors. They work wonderfully. Obviously, it's hard to give somebody a shot. A shot, there, there are protocols to do shots every two weeks, every month, or there's even protocols where you can give shots twice a year. These are agents that are very good. I wouldn't think of them as superior to statins, but in the truly statin-resistant folks, you have to remember we're doing this to arrest plaque progression. So, again, treating all these numbers and these risk factors old school, we need to confirm that we've stopped plaque progression.
That's easy. If you're looking at an artery with an ultrasound, a year or two later, you can look again. You can see it growing or not. And again, it, it's looking at a number isn't quite as useful as actually working with whoever is doing your vascular imaging to answer the question, is there plaque progression or is this the same? And so if you can see one artery to the next, it's actually not that hard. It's a pipe. How much gunk is in it? Is there more the next time you looked? Because if there's more, then we need to do more. If somebody is growing plaque and we allow that to happen, we, the doctors, that's kind of our fault because biology is trying to grow plaque. We have to stop it. We're, we're cheating. And based on your plaque burden, you have to start asking the question, what is the best stroke prevention medication for this person? This is a phrase you should be asking on all of our patients. What is your stroke prevention medication? Because everybody, by and large, should be on one. That is the default. What is your stroke? And depending on your plaque burden, we'll get into that. Basically, you're going to need to be at least on an anti-platelet agent, if not on dual pathway inhibition. See. Risk factors, I don't like the term risk factors because that implies that this is somehow a game of chance. There is no chance involved. This is methodical. We will all, go ahead, show me a 100 year old who doesn't have atherosclerotic changes. It's not going to happen because it's a natural part of the aging process. It's time. It's not a matter of chance, it's a question of time. So it's our job to know the plaque burden, not to feed it to arrest it and to make sure you're on appropriate stroke prevention and to confirm that we're doing everything we need to do. So the second shocker I give a lot of my patients is being on a pill doesn't make you unhealthy. I love it when I have folks 50, 60 years old, oh, I'm healthy, I don't take any pills. Really? If you walk into my office at 65 and tell me you've been on a statin for 15 years, you're going to have much healthier arteries than a guy who waltzes in and says, oh, I just eat right and exercise all the time. Look at me. I look good on the outside, but you have no idea what you look like on the inside. Yeah, my dad had a stroke at my age, but by golly, I, I run. I'm great. You're fit. You're not going to have heart failure, but you're not immune from your genetics in time. So it's like doing car maintenance, okay? We take our cars in for maintenance because over time, gunk builds up, things wear out, but we can do that to prevent that from being a happen. I'm sorry, growing plaque is an entirely preventable thing. Not avoidable, preventable. Prevent is an active verb. And you slow down that aging process to some degree with lifestyle, great, but that's feeding the plaque. But when we want to stop aging, we need to use a pill, and we're the ones to prescribe it. And it's really not that hard. It's just a statin for crying out loud. If you have any patient old enough not on a statin, you really have to know that their arteries are pristinely healthy before you can feel comfortable saying that you shouldn't be on statin therapy or on a stroke prevention medication. Okay, so that's just one. What else happens with time? Loss of vascular compliance. Stiff. Stiff pipes. There's just an enormous misunderstanding of blood pressure because all of these blood pressure guidelines were largely based on 40-year-old men. Well, what if you're 80? What if you're 90? What if you're a 60-year-old woman or a 70-year-old woman? They're different. Blood pressure is a number. It's not a disease. They will, arteries will all stiffen over time because of the change in collagen. I was a physics major, not a molecular biology major, but I'm told that as we age, collagen is an incomplete protein and changes and we lose a lot of the elastins, so our pipes get stiffer. And so stiffer pipes mean higher pressure. Higher pressure means that our heart is going to work harder. It's really about our cardiac workload. Remember, blood pressure is a number. The issue is what's the health of the heart and the health of the arteries? What's the workload on the heart and how effective is blood flow? So we're trying to get away from being just number-focused people. Okay, well, what's the health of your heart? How would you know? You, you, you need to, you're going to need to look at it because the heart is a muscle. Okay, it's a special muscle, but comparing it to skeletal muscle. If we exercise it, that's a great thing. We want to go the distance. We want to be fit. We want to have a heart that exercises well. But if you overload the weight, you're going to overload your muscles, okay? And meaning if you have undertreated high blood pressure over the years, you're going to end up overworking your heart muscle. And the skeletal muscle analogy is going from somebody who's perhaps lean and fit. Our heart wants us to be marathoners, not power lifters. So this is the, the visual paradigm to say what 
what does hypertension mean to a heart? It means you're overworking it, and it means it's thicker, stiffer, and, and bulkier. Your heart doesn't want to, you want to look like that, more power to you, great, but your heart doesn't want you to look like that. This process is different in men and women, and that's useful to keep in mind. In men, our arteries tend to start stiffening in a very linear fashion, quite progressively, typically in about the age of 40, and it's inevitable. Now, not everybody has to have a label of having high blood pressure, but we need to understand that everybody's arteries will change. In women, it is much more variable and usually much later. Women tend to have a much more flexible circulation. Women go through their menstrual years and a pregnant woman has to significantly increase blood volume. They're really in an estrogen driven flexibility and that's terrific. But a decade or so, usually 10 to 15 or 15 plus years post menopause, there can be a rapid catch up and a stiffening of the arteries. Not a disease, normal physiology. But the thing is, blood pressure is not a number. I'm sorry, it's not a disease, it's a number. It's not the number that matters, it's the effect on the heart. Okay, uh, so if you wanna know how it's affected the heart, how do you know? That's easy, you can just look, just look. <clears throat> Again, here's Denise <clears throat> doing an ultrasound. You can ultrasound the heart, anybody can ultrasound of the heart. Hypertension alone is a val value, the reason to get an ultrasound. Like all ultrasounds, quick, painless, completely harm, harmless. The heart is a moving organ. How it looks is less important than how it works. <clears throat> it needs to work well. And so really an echocardiogram, this is an echocardiogram. I don't think of it as a diagnostic test. I think of it as a physical exam. If I meet a new patient, I am not even you want to talk to them until I've seen their echo. I'm a cardiologist. Whatever you have to tell me, I need to put in the context of knowing how your heart works and what's the health of your heart. What's, what's the point of going over symptoms if I don't know the health of your heart when I can at least start by looking at the heart? So this is easy. A typical echo you can do in about 15 minutes or so if, if you have an efficient lab. And again, uh, an echocardiography is something that can be done remotely, if you will. You don't have to have a cardiologist in a practice to get an echo. All you need is a cardiologist to help you read it. And I can read echoes remotely and have my, my technologists get uh, uh, images in a primary care office, something we do quite a bit. So this is just an example of a normal, healthy heart. Just so you can see, this is an echo just I uh, don't even remember, might even be me, who knows. The left ventricle, the left atrium, and the heart squeezes. This is heart muscle squeezing. You can watch it squeeze. Great, that's a healthy heart. Keep this vision in mind. This is one of my hypertensive patients who didn't, who didn't treat his hypertension. You can see how thick this heart muscle is. This is a thick, stiff heart muscle. We, we have a lot of measurements that we can gauge stiffness, but suffice it that this muscle is really thick. And you see, it's squeezing the ejection fraction, how much it squeezes out may be perfectly normal, but there's no way on earth that this heart produces normal blood flow. So this is an extreme example of hypertensive heart disease. There are a lot of ways we can use an echo to characterize hypertensive heart disease. How well are we treating your hypertension? I don't care if you think your numbers are great and you think you only have white coat hypertension if i look at your echo and you've changed your heart whatever we're doing you and me together you the patient me your doctor isn't good enough so you can get these echo reports and again it's nice to have an understanding of the person reading your reports some reports are incredibly uh technical and esoteric the map maker reports giving you every longitude and latitude. You know, when I'm on Google Maps, I don't need to know my longitude and latitude. I need to know if I'm lost. So actually I know if I'm lost, I need to know where to go. But there are things that change in the heart that we track by echo that are readily correlated or readily visible and correlated with undertreated pressure. Stiffness, decreased ventricular compliance report will often talk about diastolic function or diastolic relaxation. And if you have abnormalities of that, your heart is beginning to stiffen. Again, 
older hearts stiffen on their own, hypertensive hearts can stiffen a lot faster. You do not lose strength of heart over time, but you do lose flexibility. Left atrial enlargement, remember that. If you create a load on the heart, the ventricle can thicken to a pressure load, stretch to a volume load, but the left atrium, either way, it's gonna stretch out. Ah, that's where the electrical system lives. You get regurgitation of your mitral and tricuspid valve. Oh, that can make your atrial stretch worse. The thickening or hypertrophy of the heart. Oh, that's gonna to lead to back pressure and again, start stretching the atrium. And eventually you start to see elevated pressures even uh, on the right side, the right ventricular systolic pressure. These are all things we measure by echo. In other words, I can look at your echo and tell you how well your pressure has been treated, especially if I do the echo with exercise. So you're allowed to do resting extra echoes and exercise echoes. It answers so many questions. Why guess when you can just look? And again, these are appropriate tests in anybody where you're concerned about their aging, their vascular health, and their hypertension. Why do we care? This is a stroke talk because these are the changes that lead to electrical instability and atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation, of course, there's an entire second presentation at this conference on atrial fibrillation, which I encourage all of you to attend. I hear the speaker's not half bad. Anyway, the third thing that happens with time, we said number one was chronic vascular inflammation and atherosclerosis. Number two was loss of vascular compliance, arterial stiffening and hypertension. Number three is a decreased reliability of the natural pacemaker or a loss of sinus node function. The sinus node gets slower and less robust and maybe less reliable as we get older. I love this picture, the Marine Corps band. I was a naval officer, Navy doctors take care of Marines and they <laughs> take care of us. Anyway, I often compare the heart to a band, to a marching band. The drum major calls the tempo. Here's Mr. Sinus Node. He's calling the tempo and the entire band stays in step, okay? Now what happens? Over time, even the best drum majors will get old and they can lose their tempo. We've all seen this chart in the gym somewhere. Your maximum expected heart rate with age. It's like everything with age seems to go downhill. And people look at this and say, oh, if I'm 80, I'm not gonna run as fast as when I'm 18. You know what? That is not what this chart tells us. This chart is saying when I'm 80, my ability to generate a sinus beat is nowhere near what it was when I was 18. Our ability to accelerate. Essentially, older hearts like older drum majors start to slow down. That is a natural aging process, which we have no way of stopping. And this is interesting. Our athletes are often conditioned and go into their older years with a slower heart to begin with, which may be uh, great for bragging purposes, but having a heart rate of 40 isn't always that helpful when we get older. Actually, it's really bad when we get older. I'd love to say if you have a heart rate of zero, you're dead. If you have a heart rate of 20, you're almost dead. If you have a heart rate of 40, you're either an Olympic athlete or you've got a problem because you're not gonna have enough blood flow. And what happens if the drum major really kicks out? Oh, this is my second favorite band, my alma mater if anybody recognizes it. And the drum major is really has no control over the band and everybody is running a little chaotically on the field. That's how I help my patients visualize atrial fibrillation. Nobody said there's anything wrong with the band. No one said there's anything wrong with your heart. When I have patients with atrial fibrillation, I don't tell them they have heart disease. I tell them they have sustained irregularity. The drum major is having trouble keeping everybody in step. This matters. This matters a lot. And I like to tell folks that atrial fibrillation, again, go see the next talk. Uh, is more of a description than a disease. Why does this matter? Because if I took a whole bunch of 70 year olds with the history of hypertension, okay, uh, and I did long-term monitoring, I'd find that more than a third of them, 35% in a recent study, have at least some atrial fibrillation. A third of 70 year olds with hypertension, and we all know that hypertension is a natural process, so most 70 year olds actually have some degree of hypertension, Oh, so you're really kind of saying that a third of 70-year-olds of 70 have some atrial fibrillation? Yep. We've actually done this in a couple of studies. Ah, well, okay, well, they can come and tell me, nope, they're not going to come tell you they have AFib. Why? Because 90% of these patients were asymptomatic and also did not necessarily have progressive uh, symptoms from their AFib.
they didn't have symptoms. Okay, well, so what? You have AFib, but you don't feel it. Doesn't bother you? Why should it bother me? Why? Because, get this, six minutes seems to be the cutoff-ish. Six minutes of AFib is a sufficient amount of AFib to double your stroke risk. Yes, it's true if you're a low-risk person, double a low number is still a low number, but if you're not a low-risk number, six minutes of AFib matters, and it matters potentially a lot. These should be really wake-up facts, data points. Essentially what I'm saying is that a third of 70-year-olds are already having enough AFib to make a difference to their risk of brain damage. And my patients, they have a lot of different motivations, but they all really prioritize not having brain injury, not having a stroke, not having the disability. Symptoms, our third shocker, do not predict risk. The risk of having brain damage from a stroke has no correlation whatsoever with whether or not you're symptomatic from your AFib. It is a completely separate issue. It's related to having irregularity in the left atrium, which creates stasis and clots start to form in the left atrial appendage. There are other compounding reasons, but the point being, if you sit around waiting for somebody to tell you they have symptomatic AFib, we may be missing an opportunity. And you wonder why people show up having strokes. Why? Because they didn't feel their plaque grow and they didn't feel their AFib. But these are the things that give us the potential for clot formation, stroke, and brain damage. So you have to find the AFib. You have to monitor it. There are a lot, monitor for it. You need a cardiac monitor. There's a lot of types of cardiac monitors. I love this picture. I like to point out one of these four pictures I posed for. I won't tell you which one. Anyway, there are wear, there's wearable tech. Uh, different companies make different versions. They're all good. On average, most people, one study, couldn't wear the monitor more than 11 days without skin irritation. In my practice, I ask people to wear it for a week because any more becomes kind of impractical. There are monitors that can turn your cell phone into uh, an EKG. That's great. The, there are wearable monitors that can pick up um, EKGs. And the best monitor, uh, there's a couple of brands of implantable monitors you can put under your skin. The point is, one, watch the AFib talk. Two, uh, you need to look for it because you, we can't afford to wait for symptoms. So with atrial fibrillation, key points. Age is the main driver, especially with a history of high blood pressure. Kind of everybody knows high blood pressure is a risk factor for ischemic strokes, but people haven't bothered to figure out why. Why, why on earth does pressure give you a blood clot in the brain? And the answer is because you're having atrial fibrillation, don't know it. And a slower heart rate. If you walk into my office and you're over 65, 70, 75, and you're sitting there with a sinus rate of 40, uh, you know what? And you have a history of high blood pressure, even if it's not treated. I've seen your echo. The ventricle is fine. You took your statin. You didn't have a heart attack, but the atria is stressed out. You know what? You already have AFib. I just haven't found it. So I'm going to look for it. And it kind of doesn't matter to me too much what you tell me are your symptoms because your symptoms aren't going to predict risk. I kind of hope you have some symptoms because that gives me a good excuse. If you ask the question the right way, almost everybody at some point has perceived irregular heartbeats. Great. That's your, that's your prodrome to say, hey, time to make sure you don't have atrial fibrillation. It's extremely common. I actually think it's possibly inevitable if we live long enough. Okay. Uh, 40%. 1% of 50-year-olds, 70%, 30% of 70-year-olds, probably 40 to 45% of 80-year-olds. And I have a growing number of 100-year-old patients. And you know what? They all have at least a little bit of AFib. You have to look for it to find it. It is the major, a major driver of strokes, strokes that with atherosclerosis. And you're going to be asymptomatic in most cases long before you have symptoms. And AFib is not something to be cured, it's something to be managed. You don't cure AFib any more than you cure aging. You manage it. So you need to have your stroke prevention strategy, which usually is just a pill, okay? There's a pill. Take it. Take your stroke prevention medication. We'll go over that. So you can prevent a stroke. Again, at the Foxall Foundation, we came up with a simple uh, mnemonic for our patients, the Foxall formula. It's DART. It's DART, dummy. That's for me. 
D, you have to be a partner with your doctor if you're the patient. This book was written principally for our patients, but it's a great read for everybody, in my opinion. Um, you have to work with your doctor. Why? Because you can't find out your health on the inside without help of a doctor. Your average person can't go around and say, oh man, I, have, I need a cardiac monitor or, or carotid ultrasound or no my, whatever. So you can ask your doctor for help. H, what's the health of your heart and how do we know? An echo, a stress echo answers so much information, but even if you don't have those tools, you can always get an echo. A, what are the health of my arteries and how do I know? There are a lot of ways you can do the coronary CT scans. Again, my personal most useful one is the ultrasound. Again, we're not looking for intimal thickening of 40 year olds because it doesn't mean anything because everybody gets it. We're looking to quantify the risk of the plaque burden and to make sure we are on plaque prevention stroke prevention and plaque suppression. What's the health of your heart? What are the health of your arteries? What are your rates and rhythms? And a T is a time to do something, time to take a pill or time to do something to prevent a stroke. Okay, best stroke prevention plan. Um, I think stroke prevention reminds me of Seat belts. We, we, our default always used to be, I'm not doing anything until somebody tells me you're so high risk I'm going to do something. This is why scoring systems and risk systems and things like the CHADS VAST scores I find almost distracting because that has a presumption that we're going to do nothing until you have so much risk I'm going to do something. You know what? Why don't we start with the seatbelt paradigm? I don't care if you're in the parking lot. If you have your seatbelt on, I've given you protection from an accident. Wear your seatbelt all the time. Be protected all the time. Well, what, what is our stroke prevention plan? So if you ask every single patient, what's your stroke prevention medication? We have, we have to start answering that. And so for early on, if you have simply suspected atherosclerotic disease, the proverbial risk factors, again, not risk factors, things that accelerate natural aging. Or if you've imaged them and you know, like, oh, I had an x-ray and it noted coronary calcification. Okay, well, congratulations, you're growing plaque. That means you need to be on antiplatelet therapy, at least. That's the starting point, aspirin, okay? Yes, aspirin causes some bleeding, but I think it's incredibly uh, disingenuous and a disservice to our patients to assume that they're just as afraid of nosebleeds as they're afraid of permanent brain injury. Have this discussion with your patients. What are you afraid of most? Aspirin, stroke prevention medication. Aspirin intolerant folks uh, or allergic folks could take clopidogrel, fine, it's probably a little more bruising and bleeding, but it's an excellent stroke prevention medication. It's an antiplatelet agent. Well, what if I have a lot of plaque? Oh, I've already had stents. I had a heart attack. I had a prior ischemic stroke. I had a more than 50% plaque buildup in my carotid arteries. I had an femoral arterial bypass. For people with a high plaque burden, you need to do dual pathway inhibition. I would be remiss if I didn't point out the COMPASS trial, which took people with high plaque burdens and randomized them to a single antiplatelet therapy or dual pathway inhibition with an antithrombin inhibitor, specifically very low dose rivaroxaban. That trial too, like the Jupiter trial, had to be stopped early because of overwhelming up efficacy, a 44% reduction in what? Strokes. So people with a lot of plaque need to be on dual pathway inhibition. Typically aspirin 81, rivaroxaban, 2.5 milligrams twice a day high plaque, high risk patients. All right, what if you have atrial fibrillation? You need to be on a stroke prevention pill, an oral anticoagulant, a direct oral anticoagulant. There are two excellent choices on the market, apixaban and rivaroxaban. There, uh, there's also uh, uh, adoxaban and there's a few others that are just not commonly used because of they tend to be intol, they have difficulty with, with tolerability uh, or excess renal clearance. Notice I did not put rat poison on this list. If you're using rat poison to prevent strokes and atrial fibrillation, you are on the verge of malpractice. So I'd encourage you to figure out how to use the, the 21st century stroke prevention medications. They are excellent. They prevent strokes. They are safer than rat poison. They are more effective than rat poison and they're easier by far 
than rat poison. So I don't even want to go there. Now, uh, there are a lot of combinations, okay? What if you have atrial fibrillation and you have atherosclerotic disease? Typically in those folks, uh, monotherapy with the oral anticoagulant takes precedence or combination therapy in high-risk patients. So that, this is where working with a cardiovascular doctor or uh, somebody who's familiar with all of these dosing schemes can be helpful. In the Pioneer study, people with new stent or with coronary stents and atrial fibrillation had the best outcomes with Rivaroxaban 15, Clopidogrel 75. Again, there are many combinations as the risk starts, as the disease burdens rise, if you have atrial fibrillation and a lot of plaque. Okay, so our final messages. Guess what? We all age, known as immune. We can't change our genetics and we can't change the fact that time will pass. None of us know our health on the inside unless we look. We need to remind our patients and ourselves that symptoms do not predict risk of brain damage. Disease burden does, plaque burden does, atrial fibrillation does. And once you know your health, then we can know our options. Okay, you slow down the aging process. Again, diet and exercise do help. Okay, that slows aging, slows vascular aging. It keeps us fit and healthy there. It's a, a, a beneficial multiplier to be fit and to not have the metabolic syndrome. So diabetes and exercise matter. But when we wanna stop or even reverse medications, we cheat and we use medications, fine. If you're not on a statin, you need to be able to make sure that you have good justification for that. And if you're not on a stroke prevention medication, that needs to be with thought. Prevent is an active verb. It's not a passive process. So that's all we have for this presentation. You can prevent a stroke. You, our patients, you, us, our, their providers. We work together with our patients, understand and manage the aging process, pick a stroke prevention medication or have a stroke prevention strategy. Again, also as part of this uh, uh, series of lectures, we're going to do a talk on the practical management of atrial fibrillation. And I invite everybody to check out our nonprofit, the Foxhall Foundation, at foxhallfoundation.org. Thank you very much for your time.